Let's open up the gates. So open up the gates. Make way before the King of Kings. Our God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. Who can stop the Lord Almighty? Our God is the lion, the lion of truth. He's roaring with power and fighting our battles. Hey, good morning. Thanks for tuning in on Facebook. We are glad you're here with us today at Leesburg Christian Church Online. Uh, today is a kind of a neat, uh, uh, or uh, not a neat day, it's kind of like any other day, I suppose. Uh, but today we start a new sermon series uh, in the book of Second Peter. And so uh, for the next three weeks, we're going to be here. And, and here's what I'd like to ask you to do. Uh, if you haven't already, if you're watching this online, I guess you can pause right now, and if you do, uh, or, or, or you can do, do this later, but I really encourage you to take the book of Second Peter. Uh, it's, it's a letter, really. Uh, and find a, a time this week where you have 15 minutes all by yourself and, and, and read through the book of Second Peter uh, before you watch either the restless message or next week's message. And that will make you uh, kind of get ahead and kind of get an idea of where we are going in this, in this series. Y- y- you see, we often, we have this habit of taking the Bible and reading a verse here and a verse there. Uh, but it was originally written, this letter that we're going to study was originally written and, and it was intended to be not only read, but read aloud and, and heard by everyone uh, in one sitting. And so I highly encourage you to do that today as we prepare to go through this book for the next, uh, for the next three weeks. Um, that will be great. You see, this book of Second Peter, it's, again, it's originally just a letter. Uh, we call it a book of Second Peter, but it's a letter that was written. Uh, I think this is a very important uh, sermon series for us today and a book for us to look at today because I, I think it hits home in, in some pretty uh, uh, massive ways today. 
You, you see, Peter is writing in a time where the church was seeing the culture around it radically shift. The church was seeing things change. What had been normal was, was no longer normal anymore. And, and just the fact that, well, this is Leesburg, and you're watching this online uh, on Facebook on a Sunday morning, uh, tells, that's kind of where we're living today. We've seen our culture shifting, our society shifting over the past several months. This is the same was true in Peter's day. Now, now, part of Peter's issue uh, for his church was, was that this is somewhere around 30 years after Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection and ascension. And so immediately after Jesus' ascension, the church taught uh, 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 that Jesus is coming back, and, and rightfully so. They, without a doubt, were reminded of Jesus' words. For example, in John chapter 14, Jesus is with his disciples, and he says, guys, don't let your hearts be troubled. Uh, uh, don't let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe in me. Uh, I'm going to my Father's house to prepare a place for you. And if I go to pre- prepare a place for you, uh, surely I'll come back and take you with me. And, and so for the next several years after Jesus' ascension, the, the church was teaching Jesus coming back, get ready, get ready, Jesus coming back, he's coming back. But now... Some 30 years removed from the ascension, Jesus hadn't come back yet. And so the church was beginning to wonder, and individuals were starting to wonder, is he really coming back? As things still happen today, uh, the truth of Jesus' return started to be shifted. You, you see, there were some in Peter's day who were steadfast and, and, and held to the fact that Jesus was exactly who he says he was, and he was coming back. They remained strong in their faith. But then there, were a, there was another group of people, uh, agitators of sorts. And these people began to twist the truth. They began to spoil the truth. And, and, and you know, we have those same people in our world today. People who insist that the truth is a relative thing. The idea that, that, that something can be true for you and, and not true for me is an example of that. It comes from people like this. Or worse, there are people who take a a, a truth or a half-truth and they twist it to apply in a way that it doesn't really apply. You see, the people that Peter was refuting in this letter of 2 Peter are the people who, who, who downplayed the virtuous life of Jesus and downplayed the commands and the and the example that Jesus gave to, to his disciples to follow. And even more so, it morphed as time grew. And it morphed to the point where they began, these agitators began to to flaunt their sinfulness. And instead of calling it a sin, they just said this is the way things were. It was normalized. These people in 2 Peter, they morphed the gospel of God's love for us. The love that sent Jesus to put on flesh and and to live in in human form and to live a perfect life and ultimately to go to the cross sacrificially to pay for my debt and your debt. He was killed, buried, and then rose from the grave and ascended into heaven. They took that gospel and they morphed that message. And, And they morphed that message into a message that's familiar to us today. It's often displayed like this. Well, God loves me. God made me, and God wants me to be happy. And so, therefore, I'm going to blank. And it really doesn't matter what that blank is. You can fill that blank with any sin you choose. It doesn't matter at all. How how many times have you heard that? I I don't care if it's sexual or greed-filled or any other type of sin you can think of. You see, here's the thing. These people in Peter's day... They saw themselves as spiritual elites. They saw themselves as visionaries. And and maybe you're familiar with this. You see, there's a danger that we all have when we choose to no longer live under the authority of the Bible. And here's what happens. We begin to fashion God and his ways into our own image. Think about that for just a second. The false teachers of Peter's day uh, are echoed in today's religious world. 
There are groups and individuals all around us today who claim to have advanced spirituality, some type of uh, a spiritual secret sauce that's only available to them. YouTube is full of these types of people who make claims that are often uh, or, or most of the time contradictory to the Bible itself. I mean, in just a quick search, you can find there's a woman named Kat who pl- claims that she's been going back and forth to heaven for the past 20 years. And for a small fee, she'll tell you exactly what heaven's like. I say that laughing, but, but, but it's, it is a serious matter. People who claim to be visionaries, who claim to have special insight into spiritual matters that contradict the Word of God are all around us. But it's not just the crazies. We have cults like Jehovah's Witness and and Mormons who mix their strange doctrines uh, with a supposed better understanding of what the Bible uh, has to say, and and they claim to have better understanding than the historic Christian teaching. The New Age movement around us uh, includes many enthusiasts who who want and, and desire a sincere, authentic spiritual experience, but they're often misled. And that opens them up to terrible heresy, and in, in, the, in most extreme cases, it sets them up and opens them up to dangerous spiritual powers. Without a doubt, our society is fascinated with sensuality and, and unrestricted sexual activity, much like the opponents of Peter's day. Our world, much like Peter, has spiritualized loves, lust-driven decisions. You see, we all have this tendency to spiritualize our own sin, don't we? It's often expressed in the words of, of a man who chooses to live his, leave his wife for another woman. It, it might say something like this, well, I love God and God loves me, and, and he wouldn't want me to be miserable for the rest of my life. He loves me too much for that, and so it's okay for me to leave my wife to pursue this other woman. You see, here's the danger. And we have serious issues in our, world, in our world today. When we see ourselves as the moral authority for what's going on around us. We have serious issues in our world today, but, but here's the, the thing. These issues aren't race issues. And they're not historic issues. And they're not political issues. The issues in our world today, the issues that are tearing us apart at the seams, are, are sin issues. It's not buying into belief. It, it, it's buying into the belief that God endorses our own fabrications. It's not always intentional. There are some who intentionally distort the truth for selfish gain or whatever. But there are others who fall victim to this false teaching. This teaching that teaches that whatever I feel must be right. But understand, it's not just evident in the cults in the rise of Marxism and critical theory today. It's also seen in Christian churches across the country. You you see, there's a lie within the Christian church that says, all is well. This lie says, uh, within the Christian church, it says that we can overcome the enemy of our souls with no more knowledge than what we currently have at the moment. You, You see, the coldness of our own souls is just as dangerous as the enemy's hatred for our souls. The the lie that's within the church says, God loves me and God has saved me and that's it. But see, the problem is, when that's applied to our lives, we begin to separate our faith from how we actually live. Just this past week, I was talking to a, a, a friend here at Leesburg. And he asked me, he said, John, how can someone be a Christian and yet stand for things that are clearly rejected in the Bible. Not, not, not maybe, but clearly rejected. For example, how can a, a Christian believe that they are superior to someone of another race? How can a Christian support the taking of innocent life? How can a Christian justify an affair? How can a Christian cheat his company out of money? You you see, when we allow our choices to determine our theology and our orthopraxy, we make God in our image and interpret our desires for his. 
See, the problem in Second Peter is much like the problem that we face today. And so I want to invite you to jump in with me and join me as we start Second Peter today. And we'll be continuing this for the next three weeks. Second Peter chapter 1, verse 1. Let's, let's start together. It starts off, in, and it's written like a letter of the day. You know, our letters often start off with, with to Amanda. And then it'll have the body of the, of the letter and then the conclusion, sincerely, or my love, John, whatever that is. In, in Peter's day, letters were written a little different. And it would often start with, with who it's from at the beginning, and then it would have their credentials, and then would have to or who they were writing to. And then often there was a blessing to those people before the body of, of, of the letter. And so let's walk through that real quick. It starts off, Simon Peter. That's who it's coming from. And now here are the credentials. A servant, an apostle of Jesus Christ. You see, this is going to be important as we walk through this book. Peter's saying, hey, I've got some street cred here. I'm a servant. The idea here is I'm not pushing my own agenda. I'm not coming to this uh, uh, propping myself up. I'm a servant. I fall under the authority of the one I serve, which is Jesus Christ. And then secondly, he says, I'm an apostle. He's saying, remember, I am one of the original 12. I'm one of the ones who walked with Jesus, who talked with Jesus. I'm not secondhand information. I was there. I was present for the ministry, the life, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. I'm a firsthand person. Therefore, you should hear what I have to say. And then two, to those who have obtained a faith of equal standing with ours. Now, this is awesome. Peter's saying here, look, I was one of the original 12, but look, I'm writing to those who have obtained an equal uh, uh, faith as ours. That's a a big statement Peter's making there. He's saying, look, even though I'm an original 12, that doesn't mean that I am higher than you. What is available to me is also available to you in the same way. And how is that available? Well, look at the end of verse 2, or verse 1. By the righteousness of our God and Savior, Jesus Christ. How have we obtained the same, the same equal value of, of faith? It's not because of who we are or what we do. It's only because of who Jesus is. Because of his righteousness and rightness that's been bestowed upon us. Verse 2, here's the blessing for the people. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in knowledge of our God and Lord Jesus Christ. I'm sorry, I misread that. May grace and peace be multiplied to you in the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. He, he, he's saying this blessing is, I, I want you to have grace and I want you to have peace. And, and here's how you get it. Look at verse 2. May grace and peace be multiplied to you. How? In the knowledge of God and Lord Jesus Christ. If you're watching this today, and if you're anything like me, which I hope you're not, uh, I've been so absolutely tired of the news. I've found myself at times angry. I've found myself at times grieved and saddened and sickened. You know what I need? I need grace and I need peace. I need to live in grace and practice grace and I need peace. And where does that come from, Peter says, verse 2? It comes from a growing knowledge of Jesus. And then watch what he says in verse 3. He says, in his divine power, he has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Peter's saying, John, God has given you everything you need that leads to life and godliness. Everything you need, and that's all through knowing Jesus more. And not only that, we've been given what we need by knowing him more. We're also called, look at that part, called into his own glory. We are to be transformed no longer the the way we were before salvation, but changed and participants in his glory. We've been called into his glory and excellence. Peter's saying our lives should be different from those who don't know who Jesus is. 
His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us to his own glory and excellence. Look at verse 4. By which he has granted to us his precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in this world because of sinful desire. You see, he has called us to live a different type of life according to his standard and not our own. And as we do that, as we pursue Jesus in the living and in, in living with the character and the prior, priorities that he embodied during his earthly ministry, you and I are changed. And we are enabled to escape the corruption that is in our world because of sinful desire. Again, the issues that we face today are the same issues that Peter's world faced. It's a sin issue and making God in our own image. And ultimately, the church then, much like the church, I'm afraid today, they've become comfortable with sin. Let me ask this. Are you comfortable with sin? Have you and I become numb to sin that's all around us on a daily basis? Are we numb uh, to, to what we're told is, is sexual freedom, when the truth is, according to the Bible, what we see in our culture today is not sexual freedom, but sexual slavery. Are, are you numbed by the violence that our society calls entertainment? Could it be that the violence of, that our world calls entertainment has led to a devaluing of human life as a whole. You, you see, church, we don't have a, a, a race problem today. We don't have a, pa, pa, a, a patriarchal problem today. We don't have a political problem today. What we have is a sin issue. And it's an issue that we've largely grown numb to. Now, what I'm about to say, I'm about to say some things that aren't popular today. I'm about to say some things, uh, uh, but I'm not saying them as an agitator. I don't say these things to offend. I say these things because I think that this is the biblical way that we should see the issues that we're facing in the world today, the, the issues that are impacting our world. Consider this for just a moment. When our children are told that they have the choice to declare what's right for them when it comes to their sexuality, are we not setting them up for believing a lie? When men are told and treated as though they are slaves to their sexuality and that they, they can only think of sex and they have a one-track mind, when they're told that message over and over again, should we be surprised when they start to act on it? When our society tells us that we are to be identified by our skin color or our socioeconomic background or our history? Should we be surprised when no one, no one, when no, one no longer sees identity as coming from God and the God who made everyone in his image? Perhaps our numbness is what has allowed us to not escape the corruption that's in this world because of sinful desire. Peter says that our lives should be changed as we grow in the knowledge of him who saved us, who set us free, who's given us a new way of living. And we're to enter into a life that he's called us to live by his standard and not by ours. <coughs> Look at verse 5. Peter says, for this very reason, because we've been set free from the corruption of this world through the knowledge and growing knowledge of knowing him, for this reason, he says, make every effort to supplement your faith with virtue. Your faith, this saving faith that you have in, in, that Jesus has died for my sins, 
That's, he, he has died for our sins. He, he sacrificed his life for us. Faith, that faith should be added to, not for salvation, but for sanctification, for being remade. And, and you know what we add to that faith, he says? Well, that faith, that faith needs virtue. The idea of virtue is excellence in living. Virtue is doing the right thing, not as a choice, but out of instinct. Virtue is the, culmin the culmination of doing the right thing time and time and time again, so that when it becomes, so that it becomes a second nature. It, it, it's not done because of choice, but out of instinct. That's virtue. So add to faith, virtue. And add to virtue, knowledge, a growing, building understanding of God and his word. And to knowledge, self-control, the ability to not do what you want to do. You know, sometimes it's bad to do the things that we want. And to self-control, steadfastness. It's the idea of endurance, controlling yourself continually. And to steadfastness, godliness embodying the character and the priorities of Jesus. And, and to God, godliness, brotherly affection, love for one another, those who are like-minded, love for one another. And to brother, brotherly affection, love, love for all. These are the qualities that we should possess. And look at the result in verse 8. For if these qualities are yours and are increasing, they keep you from being ineffective or unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. You see, these qualities are ours to be practiced and growing. In order to keep us from being ineffective or, or, or unfruitful, they should be a, a common staple in our lives. And, and Peter is saying that we should be known by these qualities. They should be evident because as we live in these, we escape the, the corruption of the world around us. Because the world around us, catch this, as we live in these qualities, the world around us changes. It begins to, to produce a fruit, a new life around us. But if we don't practice these things, look at verse 9. For whoever lacks these qualities is so nearsighted that he is blind. He has forgotten that he was cleansed from his former sins. Peter's saying here to the church, don't become numb. Don't become numb to the truth of what's around us, of what you've been saved from and what you've been saved for. You've been saved to, to participate in the glory of God. That's not just one day heaven uh, when we die, it's for today. Don't forget that you've been pulled from death and into life. Don't be numb to your sin and the sin around you. Let's keep going in verse 10 through 15. Therefore, brothers, be all the more diligent to confirm your calling and election. For if you practice these qualities, you, were, you will never fall. For in this way there will be richly provided for you an entrance into the eternal kingdom of our lord and savior jesus christ he says guys keep working on this and and, and and prove that you are who you say you are by the way in which you live therefore verse 12 i intend always to remind you of these things peter's writing this letter this entire letter is to remind these brothers and sisters in Christ of what has happened, of the true gospel, of what the truth of the gospel is. You've been saved from this for that. I want to remind you of these qualities, though you know them and are established in the truth that you have. Look at verse 13. I think it right, as long as I am in this body, to stir you up, by way of reminder. I want to continually remind you. That's why I'm writing to you, to remind you of this good gospel, this good news that we have. Verse 14, since I know that the putting off of my body will be soon, he's saying I'm going to die soon. Our Lord Jesus Christ has made that clear to me. And so I will make every effort so that after my departure you may be able at any time to recall these things. 
I'm writing this down now so that when I die, you can continue to read that. And really, that's a blessing kind of for us today. Peter's saying here, I, I want you to stand for what you know. Stand for these qualities, and you'll never fall. And Peter wants us to be reminded of the freedom that we are being called into. Let's finish out this chapter and bring this to an ending. Look at verse 16. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were his eyewitnesses to his majesty. He says, guys, we're not making up a story here. We were eyewitnesses to what Jesus did and what happened with Jesus. Verse 17, for we received honor and glory from God the Father when the voice was born to him by the majestic glory. This is my son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves were eyewitnesses, he's saying. We heard this voice born from heaven for we were with him, that's Jesus, on the holy mountain. Peter's looking back to the, uh, when we read the Gospels, we read about the transfiguration of Jesus. When they saw Jesus in his glory and the voice of God saying, this is my son who, who, I, who I love. With him I'm pleased. In verse 19 he says, we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention to as a lamp shining in a dark place. Until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Peter's saying, guys, remember, I was an eyewitness to the glory of Jesus. Manifest on the holy mountain. We were eyewitnesses and we brought this message with us to you. You heard it from us as eyewitnesses. And so be warned, and we'll see that in chapter 2. There are false people who are teaching other teachings. But remember who we are and we bring to you. We're not pumping ourselves up. What we have available to us is also available to you. But he says, remember that this isn't just made up word. We saw it. We witnessed it. The truth. This is concrete truth. Verse 20, he says, knowing first of all that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God what they carried along by the Holy Spirit. Peter's saying, what, I, what we brought to you, what I as an eyewitness brought to you, is not from me. It's not my word, it's his word. And, and Peter finishes up this chapter by reminding them that he is a source. Peter has walked with Jesus and talked with Jesus. And from time to time, Simon Peter doubted. It, you know, it's interesting, and I think this is, this is where we'll land today. <clears throat> when we look at the testimony of Peter in the New Testament, we have uh, some rather embarrassing stories about Peter. Uh, Simon Peter is often a loud mouth. Simon Peter is someone who often speaks before he thinks, often acts before he thinks. Simon is often impulsive and immature and often extreme. But if you look back to verse 1, I think we see something kind of cool. Peter starts this letter with his first name, Simon, followed by his nickname, Peter. If you compare this to the first letter that we have of Peter, uh, in, called 1 Peter, it starts off with just fr from Peter. But this one, he says, I'm Simon Peter. And it could be Simon Peter's way of reminding his readers and us today of his two lives. See, Simon Peter, he had a history of spiritual instability and a history of failure. But then he was restored by the Lord. And this would set the stage for Peter's appeals to his readers as we go throughout this book or this, this letter. He says, I want you to remember that I was Simon, impulsive. I was me-centered and selfish, a loudmouth who often acted before I spoke, but I was made Peter, the rock. I I'm done, but I want to end with a few thoughts. 
as we start this book of 2 Peter, or this letter of 2 Peter, Peter wants to remind his readers, those who are Christians, that they have been rescued and given the tools to escape the corruption of this world. Our danger today, in 2020, is becoming numb to the corruption in the world around us. When we are numb, we don't escape. And so let me ask you today, are you numb? Well, how do I tell if I'm numb? How do I tell? Well, ask yourself this question. Does my life display faith and virtue and a growing knowledge of Jesus? Does my life display self-control and steadfastness and godliness and brotherly love and love? Are those qualities evident in my life? This week, I want to make sure to encourage you to read 2 Peter in its entirety. And as far as chapter 1 goes, it should challenge us to examine the gospel present in our lives. Are, are, Are you and I being changed? Are we marked by the qualities that lead to fruitful living and effective change in the world around us? Or have we become numb? Today, I want us to be reminded of the truth of the gospel, that those of us who have, been, who have surrendered to Christ, who have faith in Christ, that his death paid the price for our sinfulness, and his resurrection ensures that we can now live a new life. And that life is different from the world around us. And so are you. Are you different? Does my life embody Christ's example? That's where we'll leave 2 Peter chapter 1. Let's pray. God, we come to you now and we thank you for your holy word. And as the people who who aim to live under the authority of your word, God, I pray that you stir in our hearts the truths of your word today. As, As Peter warns this first century church, Lord, help us to hear that warning for us today. Lord, help us to to hear that warning today. Lord, help us to not be numb to the world around us. Lord, help us to not be complacent with our own sin. Lord, instead, help us to be active by putting on the qualities that Peter uh, talks about so that our lives and our ministry individually and as a church can be profitable, can be, can be, can be impactful, can, can be fruitful. Lord, remind us that we are rescued from slavery and and brought into a new life uh, with you starting not when we die, but today on on the day of our salvation, we are rescued and set up for a new way of living. And Lord, may we be change agents in our community. May we be agents of change in our world pointing people to the good news of freedom because of what you've done through Christ Jesus. We pray this all in his name. Amen.
Tones are many, they rise against me, but I will hold my ground. I will not feel the war, I will not feel the storm, my help is on the way, my help is on the way. Surrounds me, chaos abounding. My soul will rest in you. I will not feel the war, I will not feel the storm. My help is on the way, my help is on the way. My refuge and strength 